So, Father in heaven, this afternoon we are thankful that we can come together to learn. And Lord, I thank you because over all these years you are a God who is faithful. And you continue to be faithful to us each day. And we come here to learn how to reach the big cities, how to reach our friends, how to reach our neighbors. And Father, we are thankful that you have brought each of every one of us here. Father, again, I pray that your spirit will attend to us. Let us not depart unattended by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yesterday, we looked at the paradigm, how we are fixated on a paradigm that I believe that, or uh, we believe that is broken. We seem to be doing the same thing over and over again, thinking that we'll get the different results. But I believe it's time to change the paradigm and go back to the New Testament model. So yesterday we looked at the New Testament model, did, it, did we? Okay, let's do some recap of what we learned yesterday. In the New Testament model, what did we notice? What was the 2020 vision that we saw yesterday? What did Paul tell the Ephesus elders? That you will do things publicly and then house to house. There's two elements that work together. And why do we do it house to house? Because in John chapter 13, Verse 34 to 35 says that you can be seen to love one another. And why is that? In John 17 says that we are one. That I and the Father are one. That people can see that we're united in the homes. And it, these are very important. The public evangelism centered on the Word of God is important. Home-based, learning Christian in small group. Learning, showing love is so important. You know, I love the Adventist Church. I grew, I was baptized when I was young, at 17 years old, uh, 13 years old. But one thing I realized is that, I am, you know, what got me fascinated as I studied at university the Bible more, I got so excited by the prophetic message of our church. You know, I love studying Bible and the Bible prophecies and the history. I'm so excited by that. But unfortunately, sometimes the way those passages are studied is not taught in a very loving way. You know, we have wonderful prophecies in Scripture, but sometimes it's taught in like a fire and brimstone way, you know? Oh, we got all these things, we got all this persecution, we got all this, all this close appropriation, we got all this, you know, it's taught us like it's fire and brimstone, it's doom and gloom. But actually, those prophecies is good news. It is good news. If you're taught in a Christ-centered manner, it makes a big difference. When I really learned that, at, at, and uh, that how beautiful those passages are, and how sure, you know, when we study Revelation, we should see the, the love of Jesus in that passage. We should see Him. Because we need loving Congress, we need loving church, we need loving communities, and people who want to come. So house to house is a place where we can demonstrate love. And discipleship is where we, can, we look into training. I'm going to come into that more. Alright, so there are three places where we can learn how to change the paradigm. The first one is the New Testament church. Alright, let's look at a bit of church history. If you serve and work for uh, serve us in, uh, in ministry, sometimes there are days where you're discouraged. Whether you're an elder of the church or whether you're a leader of the church or whether you're leading a care group, sometimes you're discouraged, right? People don't show up, you can't ask them to teach, they last minute they cancel out, they ask them to do this, they cancel out. You know, because volunteer organization is tough, is very tough to lead. And at times you feel very discouraged. My friends, if you're discouraged, I want to tell you one thing. What keeps me going when I'm discouraged? Read church history. When you read Adventist church history, you'll be excited, you'll be revived. Because you see how the self-sacrificing spirit of our pioneers are. And I would encourage you, if you're down, take it as a tip, a hint. Read Adventist history. Um, you don't know what can't read, watch YouTube. Look for Keepers on the Flying on YouTube. And you, you just learn fantastic church history stuff. Alright, Adventist church history. Let me share a little bit of history because this is important to us. Five families came to Australia. I'm going to talk about Australian work, right? How the work in Australia started. In 1885, S.N. Hesco and a team came from the United States to start work in Australia. Because Ellen White had a vision. She saw lights going around the globe. And when she saw all these lights, they asked her, what are some of the city countries that you saw? And she mentioned Australia as one of the countries. So finally, in 1885, this is Australia. After 50 years when Melbourne was founded, Melbourne is a very young city, 1835 was Melbourne was started. And Melbourne started because of gold rush, gold rush. After the San Francisco gold rush, we had a gold rush in Victoria, and a lot of people came to Melbourne to work. This city focused on gold. This city 
It's all about making money. This city is about trading gold, and people will focus on that. If you come to Melbourne in 1885, you will realize that people are too busy chasing after money. How did these Adventist pioneers come to win souls in Melbourne? How did they start a church in Melbourne? Pretty interesting. I began to search the history. And I went to the Alan G. White uh, Research Center in uh, our college, Avenda College, and I came across uh, some of the, the reports that were sent um, in the general conference about how we go about it. As and Hassel came with a team of five, five families, and after they, this is what they did. They ran two evangelistic meetings, and they did literature distribution house to house, and they did home Bible readings. They did Bible readings for the home. So they did, they did evangelistic meetings, they did literature distribution, and they did home Bible readings. And within one year, 90 people started the first church. Would you like to plant a church like that? Would you like to start a church that within one year, 90 people attended the church now? Within the second year, 200 people came. Six years later, when, before Ellen White came, six years later, Ellen White came in 1891, and there were 700 members in multiple churches. They had an explosion. They had a growth. How did they explode so quickly? Would you like that? How many members are there in whole Penang? Pastors tell me there are about 500 members here in Penang out of 1 million people. What if we like to plant a church that starts with 90 people and become 200 people and become 700 people in a few years? Would it be exciting? Would you like to do that in KL and PJ and everywhere in Malaysia? Would that be exciting? I think that God's, that's what God wants us to do. So what did they do that they have an explosion? What did they do that they have this sort of growth? I began to study. So I finally found a report. And I, I, I found this report at the White Estate. And it was a, a, a report that was sent from S.N. Haskell to the General Conference after he came for 12 months. And it's very interesting. When, when I got through this report, and several key ingredients showed up. And here's some of the key ingredients. They did, event, they did publicly, they did evangelistic meetings. But notice they also do home Bible readings. Now what is Bible readings? How many of you heard this book called Bible Readings for the Home Circle? Put up your hand. Alright, those of you younger ones, you don't know what it is, right? Yeah, go to your library, it's in there. It's called Bible Readings for the Home Circle. Those of you, if you the younger ones you don't understand, go ask your grandparents or your older your parents. They will know what this book is. Bible reading for the home circle basically is a book that has a topic and they have 10 questions and Bible verses for each question. You understand? So there's a top, there are 300 some topics, question, Bible verse, question, Bible verse, question, Bible verse. So what they were they doing? They were going house to house and they were setting up groups to do Bible readings all around the place. Bible readings. And they would do that for many months. And then today it's called like care groups. But in those days, they call it Bible readings. It's very interesting that after a while, they, the church, they bring them to the evangelistic meeting. This is the oldest church in Melbourne, of mainland Australia today. It is called the North East Rice and Adventist Church. Ellen White actually preached in this church. And this church has been there for over 100 years. In fact, it's very close to us in Gateway. It's only about 8 kilometers away. We're in the city and they are about 8 kilometers north of us. I want you to notice something here about the church. Notice that they had multiple churches. They are a, a church planting movement, can I say. By the way, did you know how many people are baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, worldwide, every day? Do you know how many people on average is baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide? How many, how many do you think is baptized every year? Every day? I want to tell you it's close to 3,000 people. Did you know that worldwide today, 3,000 people are baptized every day in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord for that. I want to tell you another interesting thing. Every hour, anywhere in the world today, every hour, four brand new churches are planted. 
in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. We are one of the fastest growing denomination church in the world. With every hour, four new churches are planted every hour in the Sunday Adventist Church today. Amen? Praise the Lord. We have a, such a, a, a planting movement. Oh, we wish to see that here in Penang, don't we? We wish to see that in Kuala Lumpur. We see it there in Johor and PJ. We love to see that. That we are a church planting movement again. And that's what our pioneers are like. By the way, this old church, do you know how many people it sits? It was the first church to build in Australia. Do you know how many seats are there for capacity? At that time, the mainline church, the other churches, have 1,000 seats, 500 seats, because we had gold. Melbourne was a rich city. So all the big churches were over 500 to 1,000 people. The big cathedral is about 2,000 seats. But you know when they built the church, the Adventist church? You know what is the, the first Adventist church? You know what is the sitting capacity? No more than 130 people. Why? Did our pioneers lack vision? Did our pioneers say that all oh, 130 would be happy, no need to grow anymore? Did they lack vision? I don't think so. They decide to plant more churches. If you go to Australia, you find that churches that are over 70 years old, most of them sit up to 130 people only. 130, 140 people's capacity only. If you go to America, you see the same as well. In our early Adventist history, there is a reason for that. We did, it wasn't lack of vision. Our pioneers were not lack of vision. Our pioneers had a vision to multiply churches. That's what they had. Oh, by the way, uh, do you have McDonald's here in Penang? Yeah, you have McDonald's, right? Uh, how many of you have been to a McDonald's store recently? Do they look the same from one store to the other? Roughly the same, right? Okay, how many of you have been to a shopping mall and uh, how many of you have been to a mega McDonald's? Have you been to a mega McDonald's with 100 serving counters? Have you been to one? How many of you have been to a mega McDonald's with 100 serving counters? There's none. There's none in the world. You know what? McDonald's, you go to a shopping center, on the ground floor, McDonald's has mainly optimized, optimized to six to eight serving counters. Right? But McDonald's queue is getting busy. Guess what did they do? They, they built another McDonald's in the same shopping center on level two, next to the cinema, right? And if they get full, they build another McDonald's. Why is that? Why didn't they build a mega McDonald's? Have you ever thought about that? There's no mega McDonald's. You know why? McDonald's hired some of the top operational research uh, work, um, analysts. They hired some of the top marketers, customer service study personnel, and they realized that the best service, the best interaction is when you're operating six to eight counters only. That's a Where did we get the idea of building a mega church from? We see, I don't see a mega McDonald's. You see, churches that are about 130 people are the best sized church for optimal interaction and optimum uh, family and community spirit. If your church is 20 people, it's a bit of a struggle, isn't it? I know some of you come from small churches. So when you're 20 people church, and I've been there, we've been there for a 20 people church, and we're small, 25, 30 people. I realized that everybody got to wear triple hat, isn't it? You got to be the, do the bulletin, you got to do the translation, you got to do, you got to do everything, right? Because the church is small. But when you reach about 50, 60 people, you realize you can do some interesting ministries, right? By the time you reach 130 people, it is really nice, isn't it? You got to have different ministries that are serving well together. But you notice that when the church goes up past 170, up to 200, suddenly we begin to lose touch with people. Have that happened to you? You go to a 200 people church, you walk in and walk out and nobody notices you? Does that happen? I think our pioneers were very smart. I think our pioneers start, knew that we are more like a McDonald's and a Subway rather than a mega McDonald's or a mega Subway. Our churches, our pioneers had this strategy of planting churches of certain sizes. And that's why we were a planting movement and a growing movement. 
So I am encouraged to see that some of you have gone and planned churches because this is absolutely necessary. It is the paradigm of our pioneers. And we need to go back to that paradigm to plant churches again. You know, some churches, I, I, I did a training in one of the largest churches in the South Pacific Division. And I went to this church, and this church has, has about 900 members. And they were embarking on another multi-million dollar project to expand their church. You know, when you have a big church, you're going to keep expanding, right? They have to raise millions of dollars to expand their church. I asked the pastor, why do you bring me here for training? Oh, we need more care group. we need more small groups in our church, we hardly have any. I said, how many pastoral staff do you have? This is an this church. Oh, we have 11 pastors in this church. 11 pastors looking after a 900 member church. And they even have a full-time pastor just for small group ministry. So I asked them, how many small groups do you have? Oh, we got about eight. I said, eight? How many in the, in the homes? Two. Where's the rest? Oh, it's seven school groups. They're not cat groups, they're seven school groups. So I, I, I asked the pastor, okay, let me ask you, 900 people, how many people are active in this church? He said, oh, roughly about 5%. So I said, you mean 45 people is entertaining the other 865 people? He said, yeah, that's what's happening. They are all spectators. They all come for a show. They all come for a performance. So we begin to start training into care group ministry. Today, this church has over 30 some care groups. And some of the care groups are beginning to plant new churches in that country. And I praise the Lord for that. Rather than embarking on a multi million dollar project to re expand the buildings and so on, they are planting new churches and growing new churches. If we go out and plant new churches for the sake of the kingdom, God is sending us for a good reason. Amen? Yeah, and that's the purpose why we're doing that. And so, they, our pioneers were church planters. They were planting new churches, multiple churches. In fact, there were about six churches when they when Alan White came. Now, what did they do? Here's what uh, here's what the report says. In uh, page 24, it says three ministers began a home visitation program and giving Bible readings and holding cottage meetings at every opportunity. You say Alan White don't use the word care group, but you see the word Bible reading. You see the word cottage meetings in our writings. And you will see this over and over in, in Spirit Prophecy. This is three months before the evangelistic meeting. This is the groundwork, this is the sowing, this is the cultivating. And in September, the tent was erected in North Fitzroy. Elder Collins opened a series of Bible lectures. Do you notice they don't call it evangelistic meeting? They call it Bible lectures. And the first night's nice attendance was 200. Some had come from the homes where Bible readings were being held. Our pioneers followed the New Testament model. They did things publicly, and they did things past the house. The 200 people that came, the people that stayed on for the evangelistic meeting, are those that are mainly those who have stayed on in the Bible readings, because they come from Bible readings. So Bible readings was very important. It was a groundwork for the, for the church. I don't know why I say this in Testimony, Volume 9, Page 116, very good quotation. And many times I see um, uh, the, our pastors and our conference workers use this. He says, the, workers of, the, the work of God in this earth can never be finished until men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. I've seen this used so many times by church uh, leaders in our church. It is true, the work of God can never be finished unless we put the efforts together between ministers and, and, uh, and members. But how do we go about that? She not only tells us uh, the importance of it, but she tells us how. Let's read the next one. Sabbath School Worker, uh, 1889. She says, the idea of holding Bible reading is what? The idea of holding Bible reading is what? A heaven-born idea. <laughs> Wow. It's an idea from heaven. It's a heaven-born idea. It opens the way to put how many? Hundreds of young men and women into the field to do an important work which otherwise could not be done. You want to mobilize the church? You can run a once-off 
music concert, but only a few get involved. And it's only one song. You can run an evangelistic series, but it's only for a few weeks. You need to mobilize the church to get involved. Follow the heaven-born idea, which is to have home groups, Bible readings for the homes. So, can you see what I'm saying? The New Testament church, there is, uh, there is already this uh, model of publicly and customized. Our pioneers, Adventist pioneers, they want to grow the work in the city, they have a blueprint, they have an approach. And they already do publicly, and they do also home group ministry together. Bible readings from the home. So what does it mean? How do I translate that into what we're doing today? So let me ask a few questions. Again, this is school, so please, uh, please uh, feel free to give me your answers. Don't be too quiet there, because this is a, a, ter a terrible shift to keep you awake. I know it's tough, the air condition is so nice, and the weather, the chair is so comfortable. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at your shoelace, and your shoelace is getting blur, I know it's okay. But you're just hanging there, alright? So let me ask you a question. When Jesus talked about soul winning, what metaphor does Jesus often use? I'll make you fishes of men. Yes, very good. What are the metaphors that Jesus used? Farming. farming metaphor, yes. And what kind of farming did Jesus talk about? Is that the commercial farming that we do today? No. What else? What metaphor did Jesus use for so many? Farming is a very key one. And what kind of farming did Jesus talk about? Jesus, how many of you remember a parable called Parable of the Sower? The sower saw the seed. How many kind of soil? Water my kind of soil. How many of you remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? Yeah. The enemy has sown it. And, the, and Matthew 13, Jesus said, wait until the harvest. Don't go and pull it up yet. Wait till the harvest comes. How about this saying that Jesus made in Matthew 9? The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Another agriculture concept, another farming concept. Have you heard this one? You reap what you another agriculture concept can you see jesus used a lot of farming concepts in the concept of soul meaning he did use fishing as well there are a few passages on that but predominantly it was the area of agriculture now when we want to run a church you got to think of a church like a farming business What do I mean by that? How many of you are in church committees or church board? Any of you in church committee, church board, put up your hand? All right, okay. When you're in church board and church committee, what is the biggest fight? Okay, I know you don't fight. You guys love each other so much, don't you? You're so huggy-wuggy, you know? This is a lovely church. But let's say you have a, a, a strong discussion. When you're having a strong discussion, what normally is some of the issues? Money. What else? Color. Huh? Color. color. Color of the chair. Color of the carpet. <laughs> oh, color of the plain building. Okay, very heated discussion around those areas. Yeah. But another one that often becomes a discussion. What is that? The matters, yes. You discuss about matters as well. It is an important issue, right? But another thing, that you have to coordinate a lot because in church there are certain things called prime time. Scheduling, isn't it? You know, you know there's certain parts of church program on Sabbath that is prime time? Like everybody wants this slot, right? You know, like after lunch, everybody wants that slot, right? Because 4 o'clock slot is the graveyard shift, right? It's really tough. So I want a 2 o'clock shift, okay? So let's run AY there. And AY said, I want AY program there. Choir said, no, 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 choir should be on that time. And then the youth said, no, 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 we should do a community outreach. Right? Do you have that discussion? 
Ah, and then you're trying to coordinate your calendar, right? You coordinate your calendar, and there's some prime time in calendar because it's like school holiday time, right? And you're working out your schedule, who should have certain slot. And the women's ministry say, oh, we're going to have a, a training by the mission here. And the pathfinder say, no, 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 we're going to have a camp here. There's a camp on here. And, and then the church say, no, we want to run evangelistic meeting here. Have you had that problem? Everybody fighting over the different weeks in the schedule. Do you know why we have this sort of discussion? And why we have some strong discussion? And we don't seem to agree? It's because we don't understand the cycle of evangelism. We don't understand Jesus' method of soul winning. Jesus' method of soul winning is always agriculture model. Always farming model. What do I mean by that? Because you need to... It's like a farmer's funnel. You see, that's a funnel. You need to sow first. And then you need to cultivate. And then you need to harvest and you need to nurture it. That's normally what you do in farming, isn't it? If you don't sow, don't expect to have a harvest. Some people say, okay, we're going to have a reaping campaign. Have you heard of that term? Adventist is this term. We're going to have a reaping campaign or a harvest campaign. And we're going to bring this evangelist into our city. And we're going to preach this message. And you know, you saw the paradigm yesterday, right? We're going to preach this message and we're going to have a harvest. But if you don't sow, what happens? Will you get a harvest? No. We try by distributing last minute, calling friends last minute, and nothing results. We need to sow first. The sower sows the seed. We have to sow the seeds. And after you sow the seeds, you need to cultivate, right? What is cultivating? Build friendship, build community. You need to build all that, show love, build, uh, support each other, pray for each other. You need to cultivate. You know, my wife loves gardening. She loves to plant flowers. I, I, for me, flowers, guys, you know, flowers, whether it's there or not, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, we're very functional, you know, guys. We just want, we'd rather have an apple tree or we'd rather have some fruit trees and it's more functional you eat from it, you know. Flowers, come on. Anyway, my, my wife loves to plant. She sows a lot of seeds and she plants these flowers. But one thing is that she doesn't like the cultivating, she doesn't like the, the weeding. So she said, Johnny, you gotta go weed the garden. Oh, you want me to go do weeding? It's so cold in Melbourne in winter. And I'm so tired all day Sabbath in church and Sunday I just want to chill out and rest, you know? Can I just sleep in? No, 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 you gotta go weed the garden. Oh, yeah, but it's wet and raining. Go, 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 weed the garden. I'm, I'm going to do some marketing and shopping, so you go weed the garden. So she goes shopping and do guard, you know, marketing, and I have to weed the garden. You know, me garden and wheat and flower, you know, just don't go well together. Me and me. So I decided to do what we call obvious weeding. You know what's obvious weeding? Just chop the top off. <laughs> she coming from a marketing. Have you done the weeding yet? Oh yeah, I have. Look, you see, it's all clear, but the weeds are still. And, uh, and the next week it starts to rain. And guess what? It come up again. You didn't do any reading, she says. I said, I did. I did obvious reading. Sometimes we don't like to cultivate. It takes too much time, isn't it? You know, many of us, many church, we are so good in finding contacts. We run health vegetarian cooking class. We run health expo. We do screening. We do all sorts of those things. And we're good in just sowing, but we don't cultivate. So the contacts just fall away. No relationship. You know why? Weeding takes time. Cultivating takes the longest in sowing. It takes time to build relationship. Remember I told you the story of my friend Michael yesterday? I played tennis with him every uh, Friday afternoon. Even though he's much younger than me, I'm older and he makes me run around the court like crazy. But it takes time to build friendship. Too often we're too busy and we're not able to build this friendship. And that's why our result for our harvest program is weak. Because we don't cultivate. And then we run the harvest program. And then after we harvest, we need to nurture. We need to train, we need to equip, we need to disciple. 
This is important. Many of you understand the theory of the cycle evangelism. But let me turn it now to practical implementation. Church boards, church committees, youth committees teach this concept. In Gateway, what we do is that the first part of our year is sowing. So we tie to, ba to basically the target group that we're reaching out to. And we will sow maybe from February, March, April, May, and then we'll cultivate in June, July, August, and then we'll run an evangelistic meeting, and then we'll do a, a, in November, December, and January, we'll do some training and the And that's our calendar every year in our church. Our church board operate on this calendar every year. Now, when you do farming, do you have a different calendar every year for your farming? No. Don't you? You follow the seasons, don't you? You know when the rainy season, you know where the wet season is, you know when to sow the seeds, and you know when to harvest, don't you? And every year you roughly have the same cycle. But why is it in the church we don't have that? You know, sometimes our church board meeting is like this. We got a year calendar. Every ministry, fill your calendar. So we fill in the blank. Okay, youth ministry, what do we do this holiday? Okay, let's do this. Okay, this weekend is free, let's do this. Okay, let's bring the camping here. So we just fill, 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 fill the calendar with no cycle evangelism there. We're just so busy doing program after program. Isn't that true? Woman ministry, children ministry, doctors ministry, all fill the program. And then they come to church for meeting. This is my calendar. Don't you ever touch my calendar. I want all the dates. And then another ministry says, this is my calendar, I want all the dates. Right? And you end up arguing over the church board. You know why? Because it's just filling the slots. But if you teach the church board, this biblical model, if you teach ministry leaders, if you teach the youth leaders, if you teach all the women ministry leaders, whatever ministry, personal ministry leaders, that the Bible follows a cycle of evangelism. Jesus followed this cycle of evangelism. If this is the model Jesus used, why don't we use it? So, let's say we are running an evangelistic meeting here in September as a harvest program. And Pathfinder wants to go on, go on camping in September. I will ask Pathfinder leader, is it sowing, cultivating or harvest, that program? That can be true. Is it sowing, cultivating or how, how does it fit in the cycle? If you are going to do a sewing program, Pathfinders, do it here at the start of the year. Do a camp up there, get to know the parents, get to know the friends of the Pathfinders, so that you build friendship and community and relationship with the parents, and then you bring that to the harvest program. You understand what I'm saying? Is this clear? If, if women ministry want to go away on a, on a retreat during harvest time, we go like, why? Is this sewing? Is this cultivating? Or is harvesting time? If it is clear that this is the cycle that your church operates on, then your calendar will always follow this cycle. Do you understand? Then you will reduce the argument and the fighting among the different departments. And different oh, you guys don't fight. You love each other here. Right? You don't argue, right? You just strongly put your point across. But this, this will reduce it if everybody understands the cycle of evangelism and leadership. And this is an important concept, not to be missed. Because if, if you miss this concept, then you as a church will always have this, comp, this money issue and timing issues. Because each program that you want to put up costs money. Do you understand? I want to do a camp, costs money. I want to do a retreat, costs money. I want to do an expo, costs money. You want to do a health expo and do a health screen, vegetarian cooking, do it all here. Bring it to the meeting. If you don't have that, then don't do it. Does that make sense? If you understand, say Amen. Amen? 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 Okay, that's clear. Alright, so, I find that in the New Testament church, they have this cycle of evangelism. I find that when I'm reading this report of S.N. Hesco, and how they go about doing outreach in the pioneer, after these pioneer days, they follow this cycle of evangelism model. So as a local church, look at your calendar. Is it just busy for the sake of busyness? Or is it working towards a harvest? Is it working towards a cycle of evangelism? Where you're building up contacts from one level to another. From, uh, from contacts, they become friends. Friends become members. Members trying to be disciples and workers. You have a clear flow through that. Every year, a disciple. 
something to think about. Very important concept, but not to be this. So when we run a snow tree, we know it's part of sewing. So we will build that, and then we will invite friends to care group. And sometimes our care group has care group retreats, and our care group retreats will occur around here in building relationships. And we run all our care group retreats there. And then when we come to evangelistic meeting, we are bringing all our friends from our sewing and cultivating activities. 80% of our attendees to our evangelistic meeting at Gateway that's, that are, are generally from our care groups. We already have relationship with them. They have friendship with us. So when they come to this meeting, they're not strange. They are learning wonderful truths of scripture. And, the, and we had this meeting here. It's one of the meetings at the university that our union evangelists that preached in that meeting as well. And, um, and some of the meetings are long, some are short. For example, some year we run like an eight session, nine session evangelistic meeting. Very, fr very friendly, we call it Bible lectures. And some years we run it longer, we do 16 nights. Some years we do it eight nights, some years we do nine nights. It really depends on the, on the pool of contacts that we have. If you have built up a large contact uh, friendship pool, then you can run a longer evangelistic series and you'll be able to bring it to decisions. The reason why we need a harvest is because we need to bring it to a, a decision point. Too often we are very good in sowing. We are very good in running care groups, very good in running uh, home groups and so on. And we build friendship with community. But you notice that people don't make decisions? How many of you have friends that come to your care group for year on year, or come to church year on year on year, but don't make a decision at all? And, it, and the reason is simple, because we haven't brought them to a harvest program. Well, think of the agriculture model. In the agriculture model, what happens before the harvest? The Bible calls it the letter as rain. What does rain represent? Holy Spirit. You need the former rain and you need the latter rain. You see this in scripture. The Bible describes this over and over, this agriculture model. You have to study this. And, and when you realize that the rain, the Spirit of God pours out, when you run an evangelistic meeting by faith, or you call it a Bible lecture by faith, the Spirit of God is poured out. It is working in the hearts of people. You bring them to the meeting, and the Spirit will work in their hearts to make decisions. Too often when I was, we were doing a, a training with a group in Sydney, and this group has been running Kagri for about three to four years. Oh, they have wonderful characters. Many, many non adventists many friends that come to the Kagri. But you know what? There are very few baptisms. About three or four baptisms only a year. And I said, what happened? Oh, we've just been running Kagri year after year. I said, have you run public evangelism? Bible lectures? They said, oh, no, we haven't. Oh, it's too hard. We're not, we're not ready yet. I said, remember Acts 2020? You do publicly and you do house to house. So they decide to run a public evangelism last year. And praise the Lord, that seven baptism. More decisions were made from that effort. Do you understand? So we need to bring it to some decision. Otherwise, it will not go very far. Okay. I remember this evangelistic series. Um, a friend of mine, the girl here in the corner here, came to this meeting. It's called the Life After Death Seminar. She came to this meeting and because her boyfriend began to attend church and got active again in church, and she wasn't a, 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 an Adventist Christian, she was more of an atheist. And her main uh, time on the weekend is spent in football. Because football was a family religion. And so on, on the Saturday, they would go as a family and wear the colors of their football team and go to the stadium, the cathedrals, and to yell and sing their songs and to bow and worship to the other sports stars, right? And so they would do that every week. And so, but her boyfriend began to attend church and began reviving, being revived and began to attend church regularly. And so she began to wonder, why is he going to church on Saturday? My grandmother is the Church of England, they go to church on Sunday. So we invited her to this meeting. So she came to this meeting and attended the lectures, eight very simple lectures, very Christ-centered message, and she heard the, the three English message. She heard about the Sabbath being taught. And she goes like, whoa, now I know why. Sabbath is important. It's in the Bible. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Wow. I didn't even know that, she says. 
So after the evangelistic meeting, by that time she had never come to any of the Alcagri. She just came to the meeting. And so for the meeting for her was not a harvest, it was more of a sowing. So note this point. Sometimes your focus may be a harvest, and majority should be a harvest, but you notice that God also brings some as a sowing time. So, but it should be predominantly for harvest if you design it well. And you should have a few that are more from sowing. And she was one of those few. So we began to uh, invite her to study the Bible. I remember the first study Bible study she had, because she was an atheist, she doesn't even know even God, was reading the book of John together. That's what we did. Read the book of John, the whole book of John, just read it together. And she began to know this person for Jesus. Because sometimes Australians, when they grow up in Australia, Jesus is more like a swear word in movies rather than, you know, um, a God, because people don't know about who he is. I've been door knocking around Melbourne City and going out with the Bible workers to do outreach. And many times when I door knock, I ask people, do you know that Jesus is coming? Do you believe Jesus is coming soon? They go, Jesus who? Coming where? You know, people don't know at all. But that's how atheist Australia is as a country. And so, she began to start doctrinal study, and I began to study the Bible topics with her. And I began to study, and she began to come to church regularly and faithfully, and she began to come to our care groups, and she began to find community, and she began to see the love of God, and I began to realize that she is making good progress. The Spirit of God is moving in her life. One day, I got to the point where I've been praying for her, and God says, she needs to be baptized. She's been coming to Kagura all this while, but not making that decision. She needs to be baptized. So I said, Lord, what do I teach her? I've studied all the topics, the 28 fundamentals I've gone through. And she's following that, she's accepting it, but she doesn't want to get baptized. And the main barrier is because her mother was, grandmother was Church of England, and that's a tradition. And the, the worst barrier was that her family goes out to the football together every Saturday. It's a family tradition. So she had to walk away from the family tradition. So this was really hard for her. But I prayed, Lord, you're working in her heart. The Spirit of God is moving. I believe the Spirit of God is moving. Amen? The Bible says the harvest is ready because the Spirit is working, not because of our work. We just so happen to get involved in it. So I remember that day I was going to give Bible study. I was walking in the city towards the house. And I realized, Lord, what do I teach? And the Spirit of God gave me an idea. She just attended a baby dedication. Oh, dedication. So I began to, to search for all the passages in the Bible. I sat down on the roadside. I, I studied all the passages related to dedication. I came to the Bible study. I told her there's dedication of the temple. There's dedication of uh, the little child uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the work of God. There's dedication in the Bible between uh, people, the husband and wife. And I said to her, did you know that there's another dedication? It's between God and man. Do you know what a dedication is? You know what happened? She looked down. And she didn't want to say anything. It was very quiet. I was sitting there in the, the table. You know when there's this quiet, awkward silence? You feel like you want to say something, right? Because it's so, so uncomfortable, right? But I knew the Spirit of God is moving. I said, you know when, when there's conviction? The Spirit of God is moving. Don't, don't work against the Spirit of God. Watch what the Spirit of God is doing. And I begin to realize the Spirit of God is touching her. I just looked at her and I smiled. And I prayed in my heart for her. I said, Holy Spirit, just do what you need to do. I prayed. And she looked up. It feels like a few seconds, but it feels like a few minutes of the awkwardness. I didn't say anything. Just, mm, kept my mouth shut. Sometimes we, we interrupt the work of the Spirit, you know. When we're dealing with you, we just have to watch what Spirit God is doing. And so she got up, and tears began to roll on the side of her eyes. And she said to me, Johnny, for two weeks, I sense I need to get back to this. Whose work is it? It's the Holy Spirit. All that months and all that while she's been coming and refused to get to make that decision. But the Spirit of God is moving. Amen? All the time. And today she's baptized. Today she's serving in our church and being involved in our ministry. Amen. Praise the Lord. And now she's involved in care group. She's, in, she's, she's helping in the care group and organizing stuff. So what does that mean? What I'm trying to share with you is this. Care group is not just 
uh, one-off event, it's just not another department. You need, we need to run sewing events, bridging events to the community, but we need caregivers to cultivate that friendship, bringing them into a harvest, and even after the harvest, there are some people that are new, they are brought into care group and to nurture, and to build relationship, and bring to decision. Can you see why X2020 works? When you sow pub when you do publicly, and you do house to house, it always works. Because that's the model you see in the investment. That's the model you see in what our pioneers, the Adventist pioneers are doing in the early church. We need to do it publicly, I, I don't know how to stress it, but this is a super important concept that you need to get across in your mind. Okay. Another element of gateway is worship. Now, whilst we have care groups, while we have public evangelism, it is also important to have worship. Now, when we design worship, we realize that many of our worship, we keep doing things over and over again without questioning why we do certain things. Is our worship friendly to visitors? Is our members comfortable enough to bring our friends to our church for worship? Worship, our bulletin, is our bulletin friendly or full with Adventist jargon? I remember bringing a friend to church, a non Adventist friend, a non Christian, and the, and the usher said, Happy Sabbath! The, 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 the secret goal, happy what? Happy is, uh, I thought it's Saturday. Is there such thing as happy Saturday? They don't understand our, our language, do you understand? We come up in, in the, our church MC, happy Sabbath church! And the visitor go, happy what? I don't mind we say the word happy Sabbath, don't get me wrong. I believe it's important to say happy Sabbath. But let's say good morning and happy Sabbath. Because that's more friendly to the visitors. They understand good morning, don't they? Good morning and happy Sabbath. So is our worship designed in a way, sometimes we, we do it so naturally because we've been in church for so long that we don't even think of it anymore. You know, it'd be so good if you invite a non-church friend, a non-Christian friend to do help you say, hey, if you've got a best friend, invite them to church and say, I don't need to come to church because I want you to worship. I just want you to help me to do a church assessment. I want you to come and come to my church and you, I want you to assess how friendly our church is and be honestly brutal, brutally honest with us. Is that okay? Sometimes they open the bulletin, they look at the, 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 the announcements and the, and the things in there. We don't understand it. They don't know when to stand, when to kneel, when to sit, when to sing, when to, you know. We need to be friendly even in the way we design our bulletin. Is our worship friendly to those new people that come? I remember I was I brought up I had a Bible student. He was a non-Christian, non non-Christian. Non he was actually Buddhist background, and he was studying the Bible with me. And he'd been attending Gateway for a while. And uh, he said, "Johnny," and I told him I'm going to preach in a country church somewhere in Melbourne. He was out in the country in Victoria, in the countryside, and on the fringe of the city. I said, "I'm going to preach there." He said, "Can I come?" I said, um, mm, "Maybe." Because I wasn't sure how friendly that church is, you know what I mean? So I said, he said can I come? I said, I never attend any other Adventist church. I said, Gateway, can I come? I said, well, okay, uh, maybe you could come. So I came, I brought him to church. We arrived to church. Nobody greeted us in this small little country church. There's about 35 people there. Nobody greeted us. We just walked in. We went into the back of a Sabbath school class. And the teacher just said, oh, okay, and continued to teach. Nobody greeted us. And then I was to go back to prepare to preach, and they finally figured out I was the preacher for the day because the pastor was away, and they realized I was the preacher for the day. <laughs> oh, you're the preacher. Oh, okay, welcome to church, you know. And so they finally took me to the back room, right? And my friend was to find a seat by himself, and he's not a Christian, not an Adventist, so he's just starting the bar with me. And he was sitting on the seat in the corner over there, and then an elderly lady tapped on my shoulder. You're sitting on my seat. I sit here all the time. 
my, my, my non adventist friend, my Christian friend, look, got up and said, Where is your name? <laughs> I'm sure Elaine churches are not like that, right? They're all very friendly and really cool, isn't it? Yeah. But I tell you, it doesn't exist. Some of our church are not safe place to bring non adventists That's the honest truth. I'm sorry to say. We need to change it. We need to assess every single thing we do from, from ushering, you know, do the process flow from the point somebody walks into that door, are they guided to the right classes, are they able to listen to a discussion and in the service class, are they able to come to worship and follow the worshiper, how are they guided to the, to the potluck, you follow that process yourself and see whether you can follow through if you're not Christian. We need to design a worship. In Gateway, when you come to our church, the ushers welcome you. And the, the closest class to the door is always the visitor's class. You know why? Because you don't want your visitor trying to find around looking for the class. Do you understand? The classes that is closest to the door should be the visitor's class. Do you agree? So that they don't have to find where your, your map is. How to get into your church. Design a class that way. And make sure your ushers hand over to the teacher by introducing them to the class teacher. Rather than, oh, the class is there, go yourself. Bring that person to the class and say, hey, uh, Gary, you're the teacher today. I introduce you to John. John's coming to your class today. Gary, John's going to join you today. And we design everything that we do. You see, if you just, I, I'm, I don't want to just tell you that Kendrick is a silver bullet to solve your problem. I don't think it is. It needs to be holistic in the whole integrated plan of how a church runs. You understand what I'm saying? You need to have can group and public evangelism, but if your weekly things fail, you also have a problem. It's not going to solve that. So can group has got to be part of the integrated solution. So worship is a very important thing. And over time, we've been able to build up our worship, and the Lord has just blessed as we move to larger venues, and, uh, and the congregation continues to grow. When we reach year 170, we begin to face that problem of people missing. And we begin to study our church history again, and we realize we were a church planting movement. We took a strategy not to build a 500 people church. We decided to build a strategy to plant churches because we saw that in what our pioneers were doing. We did not choose a mega McDonald's model, we chose a McDonald's model. Right? That's what we decided to do. And so we decided to multiply church. That's why you see the different colors. That's where we multiply to another church. And then we multiply again as a church. By the way, there's very few case study in the Adventist world today of a, of a church that intentionally multiplied multiply churches. Very few case study. There's some case study in Texas conference. If you want to study that, I've studied that really interesting case study. But Gateway is a unique church because it multiplied twice as a church. And you know, mothers, if you give birth, not easy to give birth, right? First time is tough, second time is even tougher, right? It's getting tougher every time. But we pray that God will sustain our ministry, that we can keep multiplying churches. Because that's our vision. That's what we want to do. Alright? Okay, so in our worship service, about 30% of our attendees in Gateway is about peace seekers and non adventists So even the language that we use, the preaching that we have, is all targeted because every Sabbath is an evangelistic meeting. Every Sabbath is evangelistic meeting. We have brand new people, five to six brand new people that walk into church on Sabbath. Come to our website, come to our media, come to our camp. We have brand new people that walk into church regularly. And so we need to be able to sustain a ministry that constantly reach out to new people. I'm going to talk about Sabbath school classes in the, in the next training. I'm going to explain to you all the different classes that we run in our church. Um, and, and this is where we're going to as a church. Gateway will be a soul winning and training center that multiplies churches in three years. That is what our goal is. Every three years we're going to multiply church. And that our, our focus is soul winning. Our focus is training. That is a vision. You know, turn your Bibles with me now to the book of Matthew. Turn your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, you see the wonderful passage called the Great Commission. Some of you are very familiar with it. You don't need to go very far. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, reading verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things which I commanded you, and lo, I am with you until the always even to the end of the age. The Great Commission. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, reading verse 8. Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power. Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, unto the ends of the earth. Question. Which one is a vision and which one is a mission? There's a difference between a vision and a mission. A mission is a reason why you exist. You hear what I'm saying? A mission is your purpose of existence. Why you exist, the reason you exist. A vision tells where you're going. Tells where you are. It galvanizes everybody to move in the same direction. Tells where you're going. In Gateway, our vision statement is to be a soul winning training center that multiplies children. That's where we're going. It's very compelling, very challenging, very uh, vision that galvanizes the whole church in the same direction. Question. Matthew 28, Acts chapter 1. Which one is a mission? Which one is a vision? Based on those definitions. Who says that Matthew 28 is a mission? Put up your hand. Mission. Okay, who says Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a vision? Put up your hand. Who says, I do not know? Put up your hand. <laughs> okay. Which one is a mission? What do you think? Mission tells you why you exist. Vision tells you where you're going. It drives you in a direction. Which one is a mission? Huh? Why you exist? Matthew 28. You exist because Jesus said, go and make disciples. Right? Baptizing them in the name of God. Observe them. Teach them to observe. That's a mission. That's why we are Seventh day Adventists. That's why we are Christians. Because Jesus told us to go and make disciples. This is the reason why we exist. But a vision is compelling. It tells us where we're going. When our brothers and sisters from Lighthouse Church, when you had a vision to plant a church in Lighthouse, is that not a vision? We're going to plant a church. That's a vision. It's compelling. Everybody heads in that direction. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, Acts 1 verse 8 is a vision. It's a vision. Because it says, I'll give you power from Jerusalem to all of Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost part of Can you see the movement? Can you see the vision and direction that's heading to? Let me illustrate this. Let's say I'm a, a bank manager and I've been, I'm the new CEO of, what's the largest bank in, in Malaysia? Maybank? Okay, I'm the new CEO of Maybank. I've just been hired and I spent 100 days in Maybank and uh, I've done 100 days and I want to meet the press uh, and the stock market analysts and, uh, and, they, and I come to do a press release and a press conference. And being the CEO of a new bank, uh, of a, the new CEO of the bank, the analysts are asking me questions. Okay, Mr. CEO, what is your vision for this bank? Since you've been there 100 days. Because the stock market analysts are very vicious, right? If you don't have a vision, what do they do? They stop, they top down the stock price, isn't it? They write it up with a good, good price. So it's very important press conference. Okay, Mr. CEO, what is your vision for the bank? If you say your vision for the bank is, my vision is to make money. No, my vision is to make money. So, yeah, the stock has got more. What is your vision? Of course to make money, do you understand? Which bank don't have that idea of making money? Right? It is a given. Making money, sustainable profit is a given. And some of us in our churches, we have vision statement. Oh, our church exists to proclaim the three angels message. To share the gospel. Of course it's a given.
given. Of course you, you exist as a church to proclaim the gospel. It is a given, but it's not a vision. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're a CEO of the bank and you just say, you make money. They go like, come on, tell us more. But if the, if the CEO go like, yeah, I think Maybebank could expand into ASEAN. There is an opportunity for us to go to the growth region. We're going to set up branches over there, especially merchant banking. We can get into that kind of industry. And my vision is that we'll be not just a local bank, but we'll be an Asia Pacific bank. Can you see the difference? One is a mission, why you exist. The other one is a vision. OK. Let's say if I go to your church board, and your church board had just finished meeting, okay? And your church board members are walking out of the boardroom. And I ask every single board member individually, what is the vision of your church? And you have 15 board members. How many vision would I get for your church? <laughs> How many vision would I get? My brother says say 15. Will I get one vision, one shared vision from your leadership? Or will I get 15? I was doing training for a um, minister's meeting in one of the Northern Asia ch uh, countries. And this conference, I was doing this training. There were like 30 some ministers there in this conference. And I asked them, if you have 15 board members, how many vision would you get? Most of the pastors said 30. <laughs> because they can't even agree among themselves. One of the most powerful, one of the most powerful drivers in mobilizing a church is a vision. The Bible says without a vision, the people. If you just run Kangaroo for the sake of running Kangaroo over and over every week after every week after every week after every week after every week after, every week after, every week after what's the purpose? If you don't, if it doesn't bring you to a, a, a harvest program. What's the difference? It just become monotonous and boring and routine. There's no vision. When our young people have a vision to to uh, to to grow the work, I was so happy to see. Uh, I share about Gary's work in, in uh, Gary Kwan's work in Victoria University. Gary had a vision to plant a church in the West. He started one care group, two care group, three care group. Forty, fifty people begin to gather. And he started the planning church. He had a vision. A vision is a very powerful thing in the church. We need to have a common vision as a church. If your church board cannot agree on one vision, then you have a problem. Everybody will be pulling the horse in different directions. You know, when a horse have a have a rope on around the neck and there's one horse and there's like five ropes pulling the neck of the horse, right? Because you want to pull the horse in different direction. What happened to the horse? It's strangled to death. You die. And sometimes that's why what's happening to our churches, we're dying because we're paralyzed without having a clear vision. So a care group fits within um, the, the role of a care group is for sowing, cultivating, for part of the harvest. You know, during the harvest program in our church, when we run our evangelistic meeting, our Bible lectures, because most of our care group runs on Friday night, guess what the first night program is on? You know which night we started on? We started on Friday night. Because people are used to coming to Kegel. So instead of meeting in the homes, we bring them to evangelistic meeting. We line it up to the Kegel. After the evangelistic meeting is over, during evangelistic meetings on, everybody work towards the harvest. By the way, if you come from a village, I grew up in a village in Sabah, by the way, and, that's, and I know what harvest community is. Because the, of my Kadazan friends, they have uh, uh, this uh, Testa Manoi, you know, the, the, the harvest festival. How many of you know that in Sabah Sarawak, right? Very important. When, when the village is doing a harvest, how many people in the village are involved in the harvest? Everyone. So when we're running a harvest program in church, every ministry should be involved in it. You can't have Papa Hunter going one way, women ministry going another way, you know, uh, adults going another way. We all got to work towards the same vision the same goal. And that's so important. That's why you teach the cycle evangelism. That's why you teach the harvest concept. And that's how Kangaroo fits within there. And worship is within there as well. Okay. Another thing is values. Okay, I'm gonna finish on this point and we're gonna take a break. And, and before we continue. Another important thing is values. Many people may like your vision but they may not like your values. 
In Gateway, this is our core values. Bible-based, Christ-dependent, seeker-oriented, discipleship bonding, training, and accountability. What do I mean by values? Values basically means non-negotiable attributes of your group or you as an individual. These are non-negotiable. These are your characteristics. This is your core non-negotiable elements. In Gateway, Bible-based. Everything is Bible-based. In fact, you would assess my training whether it's Bible-based or not. Is that true? You, we will assess Sabbath school whether it's Bible-based or not. We will assess worship whether it's Bible-based or not. Whether our tag group is Bible-based or not. We will, is our tag group Christ-oriented, uh, seeker-oriented? Is our Sabbath school seeker-oriented? We will assess it against all these core values. Core values are very important in churches. Because if you don't have core values documented in a church, what happens is that we actually end up getting default values. Default values. You know what I mean by default values? You know, one of the default values is goes like this. Have you heard of this one? Don't rock the boat. Have you heard of this default value? It exists in the church. Don't rock the boat. We've been doing this for the last 60 years in our church. Who do you think you are, Johnny, coming here telling us this? Just because you come back from Penang with these strange ideas from Gateway, don't, who do you think you are? We will run our church like this. Many people say, don't rock the boat. They don't like this core values. Because they don't like change. We just want to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And we call that the definition of insanity. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's insane. But people are stuck with that. Don't rock the boat, Johnny. Why do you want to make this change? This is a default value that exists in some of the leadership in the church. You know what's another default value? Oh, we got to be united. Have you heard that one? We got to be harmon in harmony. Have you heard that one? Unity for the sake of unity is not what you see in the Bible. In the Bible, you see unity of purpose. Unity of purpose. Not unity for the sake of unity. Because unity for the sake of the unity is only finding the lowest common denominator. Isn't that true? If you want unity in, for the sake of unity, then you have to go down to the lowest level that everybody can agree on. But in scripture, I don't see that. In scripture, I see unity of purpose. When God's people are in one faith, one Lord, and one baptism, going with the Great Commission, Going with all power of the Holy Spirit, I see unity of purpose in the Word of God. I don't see unity for the sake of unity. Sometimes, you know, church leaders, we try to be people pleasers. We try to please all the camp and we pretend to be the United Nations Kofi Annan. Oh, who is it now? It's a Korean guy now. What's his name? We try to be, we try to be the United Nations ambassador, trying to find peace in the church. And we try to look for Kofi Annan's kind of style to find the lowest common denominator. And nothing happens in the church. If you wait for that, nothing will happen in the church. But if you, have to, if you teach in the leadership and teach in the church the unity for purpose, unity for the same direction, the Lord will bless the world. Because these are some default values that exist in our church because we don't document it, it does exist. And this is a problem. So, I used to work um, for a large corporation. It's a software company. I used to work for an American software company. And it's owned by Larry Ellison, who's the founder of this company. How many have heard of, how many have heard of Larry Ellison? You know Larry Ellison? Probably not. Because it's not Microsoft. How many have heard of Bill Gates? You heard of Bill Gates? All right, you heard of Bill Gates. OK. Larry Ellison runs Oracle. Bill Gates used to run Microsoft. Oracle is the largest business software company in the world today. Okay. And Larry is the third richest man in America today. He's worth, I don't know, 40-some billion dollars. Okay. He's very wealthy. He's in billions of dollars. Okay. And Larry owns 24% of this company. And I used to work in this company. And Larry Allison has only one core value. Even though in my company, we got very nice business cards with all our core values, you know. And if you go to our boardroom, you see them on the wall, all those beautiful statements, all those words that says, customer centricity product quality, you know, excellence, integrity. You know all those wonderful words that you pay consultants to write for you? Okay, so consultants pay you lots of money. 
you can have lots of money to get to get it on your wall, right? So we got all these wonderful statements. However, Larry Allison only has one core value. You know what his core value is? He wants to be number one. He wants. He doesn't want to be number three. He wants to be number one. So he has only one core value. It goes like this: win at all costs. That is his core value. We're gonna beat all the other competitors. We're gonna win at all costs. So he calls my CEO of Asia. Have you got this deal yet? I don't care how you do it. Win at all costs. The CEO calls the, the head of industry. I'm one of them. Hey. Have you got this deal yet? You promise you forecast it in the, in the forecast. When is it coming in? Win at all costs, right? And then I call the general manager. Have you got this deal yet? Win at all costs. He calls the sales manager. Win at all costs. He just passed down the channel command. You see, core values have to be lifted up by the leaders. In churches, if you don't document the core values, actually you as leaders of the church, you actually have core values. People are watching you. They're seeing whether you're really making changes about this church. Or you're willing to take a stand for truth and principle. As the church leaders, we need to have core values. Those of you attending the uh, morning classes on Monday, I will share with you practical tools on how to develop these core values in the church. Not the business way, but biblical ways to develop it. You'll find it in the book of Acts. Now, we need to develop this. We need to document this. Because when we document this, we say this is what we aspire to, this is what we are, this is what we're all about as a church. And we assess every single ministry, every single thing that we do against these core values. And we as leaders try to, we, by the grace of God, ask for His strength to live this out. That this should be the way that we behave, this is the way that we should do. So let's summarize before we finish our break, then we go into QA. Point number one that I try to cover today is that. The New Testament church model is adopted by the Adventist pioneer model as well. Point number two, our pioneers use very back to basic methods. They use a psycho-evangelism concept, which is found in scripture, and they tie Kegel and public evangelism to work together. Point number three, our pioneers had a vision. They went into territories and they planted new churches. They grow the work of God. They were not just into maintenance strategy. They're not into just peace for the sake of peace or unity for the sake of unity. They had a unity of purpose. They went into far countries like Australia to start the work of God. God has to give us a vision for the work here. That we will have core values that go with it. Because if you have the right values, people will come along with that vision. Sometimes we have vision, but people don't come along because they disagree with your core values. But if you have the right core values and the right vision, it's very powerful to mobilize the whole church.